That was a good story. I would have liked to see Anita do that. Someone should have taken a photo, <laughs> shaking the snake. Thanks, Anita, for telling the story. Let's just bow our heads and say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful privilege of being here together in church. Thank you that we know that you care about us, and that you are here in a mighty way. Open our minds, open our hearts so that we may hear your word, and that we may understand and see your love a little bit closer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to ask a question, one of those questions that has more than one answer. But I would like you to think a little bit about it. Who is the Bible written for? Sinner? Who is the Bible written for? Everybody. Any other thoughts? I would like to say that the Bible is written for me. Specifically, um, the Bible is a personal conversation between me and God. When I read the Bible, God is talking to me individually. It is true that it's for someone else as well, but that doesn't bother me. It's for me. Now, the thoughts for this sermon came from Talita. Um, while I was studying with her, I always asked her, is there anything that you want to know that you would like to talk about? And when we got to the prophecies and the revelation and those things, I said, Talita, is there anything that you would like us to talk about? That? And she said, yes, I want to know what's going to happen just before Jesus comes. And I thought, Talita, how am I supposed to know what's going to happen just before Jesus comes? But where do you go when you have to answer that? Matthew 24. <laughs> so, we did talk about it. and But I want to look at prophecy today a little bit different. Um, more connected to the blessed hope that we have, Jesus Christ. Um, there is, when we looked at Matthew 24, there was a few texts that I conveniently, deliberately ignored. <laughs> Sorry, Talita. <laughs> Difficult texts that I thought, what do you say about that? And it made me think afterwards. Um, Matthew 24, verse 15 is one of them. And we will go to Matthew 24, verse 15. Um, and I think it is vitally important for us to understand what that text means concerning us today. Right now in the time that we are living. Matthew 24. Verse 15. It reads, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then in brackets, whoever reads, let him understand. 
at the end of this verse, we are promised understanding if we are willing to read. Understanding for myself, not because what Pastor Peter says, but understanding for yourself. When I look at the world today, and I listen to the news, I think that our time is running short. Would you agree? Let's read Matthew 24, verse 37. It's 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And I wondered, how was it in the days of Noah? So I googled it. And I can tell you, Mr. Google doesn't know a thing. Not what I could find anyway, nothing. How was it in the days of Noah? Well, the only thing I could find was in Genesis 6 verse 5. Genesis 6 verse 5. And there it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, Continually. Now, evil doesn't necessarily mean only raping, killing, and stealing. Evil, we are told in Timothy, can also mean lovers of yourself, lovers of money. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Are we seeing that today? A little bit? This is a description of the perfection of Satan's character in the people whose noses are turning in the wrong direction. Satan is perfecting his character. And that is not that we would be wicked sometimes and good the other times. What does it say? Wicked continually. Now, with God, it's exactly the opposite. We read in Philippians 4, verse 8, that God wants the imaginations and the thoughts of our minds to be what? Pure and holy and Christ-centered. How often? All the time. Now, that's going to be difficult for us. And challenging if we are feeding on what the world presents. There's only one way in which that kind of transformation can take place in our lives. And that is, whoever reads, let him understand. To be continually reading. The Word of God. Now, after the scribe, description of how the people lived in the days of Noah, God is saying something disturbing. If you go to verse 6, I think is the next chapter, next verse. Um, Uh, 
Yes, verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. There's another translation that says the Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. It was painful for God to look at human beings which he had made in his own image and to see that they are wicked and evil continuously. But in Noah and his family, what do we see? We find God's rescue plan. It's amazing to think that God was willing to continue with a plan of salvation. Yes, it grieved him that he has made man. But he voluntarily rushed in, knowing the pain and the agony that it will cost him. Did it grieve God or did God regret that he followed through with the salvation, plan of salvation? No instance anywhere in the Bible does it say that it grieved God that he saved man. That verse says it grieved God that he made man. But Jesus has put every ounce of himself into the plan of salvation. Nowhere, anywhere, no emotion, no word, no thought, no nothing where God grieved it that he went through with a plan of salvation. Jesus is the only hope that we have. Now, in the context of the end time events, Jesus said, whoever reads, let him understand. Let him understand what? That was a question. What does Jesus mean when he says, whoever reads, let him understand? What? Two things. First of all, the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel. Now, Daniel speaks of three prophecies, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and Daniel 12. 12, about the abomination of desolation, and it's directly connected with what? The daily being taken away. There are three prophecies telling us that the abomination of desolation is directly connected to the daily being taken away. The daily is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is put in its place. The daily is taken away, and that which is made desolate is put in its place. The daily is taken away, and the desolation is set up in its place. That is the three terms that was used. So there is a direct correlation between the abomination and the desolation being the daily being taken away. So how do we understand that? What does it mean for the daily to be taken away? All right. If you go to the concordance and you look at the Daniel 8 verse 11, daily, and it gives you the Greek word where it comes from. And that word is tamid. And if you look at the, the meaning of that word, it's translated as continuity, continually, continuously and the it is the daily or the ongoing of something now that word is used 104 times in the bible seven of those 104 is daily and five of them is in daniel but the other 79 times it's translated as continually or continuous and you look 
if you look at the list of the text it gives there, most of those texts is in the first five books of the Bible, and it's directly de related to the sanctuary services. It talks about um, uh, the sacrifice, sacrifices of sin, the incense, the lamps, uh, the showbread. On Aaron's breast, the names of Israel must have been carried continuously in front of God. So it's the continual burning offers, the continual uh, lamp that uh, represents what? What does all those symbols in the sanctuary represent? Christ. Yes, Christ says, I am the light. I am the bread. I am the door. I... Christ is everything. Everything in the sanctuary points to Jesus Christ. So, all those dailies in the sanctuary points to the daily, Jesus Christ. So let's go back to the prophecy of Daniel. When we read that, we find that God is warning us that in the end, the daily, in other words, somehow Jesus Christ is going to be taken away and whatever is going to be put in its place will be an abomination. And it will make us desolate. So, whoever reads that, let him understand. How is the daily going to be taken away? Most of the time when we look at this prophecy, we relate it to the destruction of Jerusalem. We see... Um, the prophecies points us to the destruction of the temple, and that is true. But it also goes further through in history, and it points to the apostate religions that come in the place of Christ. And that is rightly so. But it also goes further in history, and it comes to today. How do we relate the daily being taken away to us today? If the daily points to Jesus, and we've established that, then we know, and we can be assured, that anything that removes Jesus Christ from our minds and our hearts, anything that takes our focus off from Jesus, is an abomination. And it will make our lives desolate. It doesn't necessarily have to be murder. And now this is the point. The whole thing that I'm trying to get across is that God is perfecting a people today whose characters are going to be transformed by beholding Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. This is a law of our intellectual and spiritual nature. We all know that it's true. Think about it in your own life. The subject that you focus on, that consumes your attention, that is the thing that will influence you. Lorik heard somewhere that it's good for you to drink coconut water. It replenishes your energy when you work in the sun. So he bought coconut water. And he didn't like it. <laughs> but because someone told him that it's good for him, 
he kept on drinking it. And now he likes it. It works like that in everything. If you listen to podcasts and watch movies where every second word is a bit colored, be careful. It will come through. If you buy a house, if you have a hobby, if you plan a holiday, it consumes your attention. If you want time, you will have it. I remember I was just married and someone gave me an old sailing dinghy. And we lived in a block of flats on the main street of town. There was no yard, no nothing. At night when the business is closed, I pull my boat on the pavement in front of the block of units and I worked on my boat until midnight because I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to feel how it is when the wind blew me over the water. The things that you are enthusiastic about, that is the things that drive you. Now back to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel 8, verse 11 and verse 12. Isaiah... Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel 8, verse 11, and the first bit of verse 12. It says, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. It talks about the little horn power and Jesus Christ. And by him the daily sacrifices is put in there, were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. How was the daily being taken away? The first few words of verse 12 is because of transgression. How is the daily taken away? King James says, by reason of transgression. The only way in which Satan can undermine the work of salvation and the ministry of Christ on our behalf is by bringing in transgression. Think about it in your own life. Sin is the thing that Satan used to mess up that connection with Christ. Either by keeping us busy while we are enjoying it, or later on through guilt. Now you can say, I'm not as, I'm not as bad as those people. And it may be true, but for us... As Christians and believers, it works a little bit different. You don't have to be a murderer. We are trying our best to live our lives for Christ. We are, we are praying and saying, God, change my life. Help me with this. Help me with that. And we are in a process of growing. And what happens? We mess up. And we get overwhelmed with this. And we says, or Satan comes and says to us, see what you've done? It's not worth it, man. Give up. And you get overwhelmed and you think, will this struggle ever end? Am I ever get over this? That is one of the reasons why God hates sin so much. He knows the power and the influence that sin can have in our hearts and in our minds to remove from us the hope we have. It removes the daily, the continual connection and focus on Christ. Do you feel the presence and the pull of sin today in your life? 
The Holy Spirit is working on our hearts and our minds. But continually Satan is trying to stand between us and Jesus. Satan is pulling out all the stops. Sin is not just out there in the world. Sin is right here in my heart. And sometimes I can hardly stand myself. And I think, God, is this ever going to end? The world may be growing crazy out there. But Satan is doing his best to remove from us the continual connection and walk with Jesus Christ. It amazes me that God is continually busy trying to pull me back. Trying to separate me, the one thing that God loves the most, from sin, that thing which He hates the most. So that He doesn't have to destroy me with sin in the end. There are a few texts that I want us to look at. Psalms 40 verse 16 says, Let such as love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. Now that continually is the same word, tamid, which was prophesied to be taken away. Let the Lord be magnified. God is in the process of bringing His people to a place where they can continuously think about what He has done for them. I thought that being saved was to be changed from stealing to not stealing. I thought God will change me from not sinning or from sinning to not sinning. But it's more than that. A good mechanic is not someone that can take a car that doesn't want to start and change it to a thing that does start. Now, a good mechanic can make a car purr <laughs> when it goes, it gets the best out of it. Christ wants to help me to wake up in the morning with a different attitude, with a bigger smile on my face, not just to have life, but to have life abundantly. Psalms 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord all the times. His praise, praise shall continually be in my mouth. How is that possible? For me to praise God continuously. Psalms 40 verse 11 says, Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. That is what we want. With God continuously gathering us and protecting us, why not praise Him for it? Do you see how the devil is trying to take away the daily out of your life? To control the regular? That experience of dependency and reliance on Jesus, our only hope in this life, Satan is trying to take Jesus out and to put the world in. While God is seeking to restore a people that is continuously magnifying His name and praise Him. Psalm 71 verse 3 say, Be my strong refuge to which... I may resort continuously. Where do you go to when you need help? Where do you turn to if you can't find rest in this world? Do you have a Savior? Someone on which you can depend all the time that will never leave you nor forsake you? 
Our lives are full of challenges and disappointments. But there is nothing like being surrounded by the Holy Spirit. There is no stress there. Psalms 46 verse 10 say, Be still and know that I am God. We come to God with our worries, and we worry about a lot of things. We worry about our children, we worry about our work, we worry about anything. But in the presence of Jesus, that goes away. Have you ever been there? Or have you been there lately? Feeling the calming presence, hearing his voice as he say, your sins are forgiven. The moment you feel anxious, run to God. The moment you feel forsaken, go to God. The moment you feel overwhelmed, call out His name. The moment you mess up and sin, pray to Jesus. He is continuously interceding for you on your behalf. He is there for you. He is your light. He is your bread. He is your incense. He is your priest. Don't let Satan take him away. Don't let Satan make your life desolate. Talita, when you think about what is going to happen just before Jesus comes. And the time in which we are going to be tested as never ever before. Don't forget what this truth is all about. It's about daily being connected and relying on Jesus Christ. When those laws are being changed and the mark of the beast comes, and we are being persecuted like never before, that will be insignificant if we are connected to Jesus. Insignificant. But for those who are not connected to Jesus, it will be terrible. Because Jesus is the only one that can keep us safe. God is calling us today to put our complete trust in Him. To live and love and walk in Him. I want to end with this thought. What was the context in which Jesus gave us Matthew 24? Let's read in Matthew 23, only two verses. Matthew 23. Let's read first verse 37 and then verse 38. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. What made the temple desolate? What gave the temple value? What made the temple holy? Everything in there pointed to Jesus. But when he came as the fulfillment of it, his own people didn't want to accept him. So when Jesus left, the temple and everything in it, all those symbols, all those candles, all that gold, all the feasts, Everything meant nothing anymore to those Jews. There were no value left in it. Verse 38 says, See, your house is left to you desolate. 
And this is 30, 35 years even before the temple was destroyed. When Jesus left, it was over. Everything in that temple meant nothing if it doesn't point to Jesus. The Jews has placed their trust in those candles, in the sacrifices, in the symbols, in their Jewishness. But everything in their temple means nothing unless it guides us to make our shelter in Jesus. 24 verse 2 says, And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. The Jews made Jerusalem their shelter. Are we making the same mistake today? Or are you making Jesus your shelter? Jesus is warning us there and says, I'm warning you, every single stone that you are building in your own power will be thrown down. Every earthly support will be taken away. Everything in this world is going to be cut down. You are going to lose every single thing you have. Are you ready for that? Nothing in this world will be left standing. Is your shelter in Jesus Christ? Is He the one that fills your day continuously? Everything else is an abomination and it will leave you desolate. I want to challenge you today. To make sure that there is nothing in your life that is more important to you than Jesus Christ. Have you given your life to Him completely, 100%? I will invite you today to recommit your life to Jesus. The only thing that can give us hope. The only thing that will carry us through into the land where we can be with Him forever. You know where you are in life. You know what makes you excited. You know what keeps you busy. You know what you listen to, what you look at, what you do in life. Is there time for Jesus Christ there? Is He the one in which you hide? While we sing the last song, think about that. And then we will pray together. In a little while, we're going home. What good is it if we win this whole world, but we lose our souls? As I pray, make a decision for yourself in your own heart, where you and God can see and be serious about it. You can read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. There's no joke in it. 
God never tells a joke. God is serious because his business is about life and death. Heavenly Father, as we stand before you, knowing that we are but dust, Father, it is only in your name, it is only through Jesus Christ that we can even come to you. But we are here and we beg you, Father, take us home. Fill our lives so that we may continually be connected to you. Because you are our only hope. Father, thank you for what Jesus has done for us. We praise you in his name. Amen.